just my honor to be here to speak to you all. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, an interesting topic, Rise of Copper China and the 12 5 year plan. And I also want to give you a little bit of my background uh, in addition to what professor have given you uh, so that you can appreciate the perspective. I am a partner of Ernst & Young US, so I'm a US partner. I uh, have been with Ernst & Young for 22 years. I have been serving really mainstream corporate America client, Western multinational for most of my career. But being one of the very few Mandarin speaking transaction partner with the big four firms in the US, when we formed this new network, the China Overseas Investment Network, um, they asked me to help with the operations in the Americas. So in my uh, area road, I organize all of Ernst & Young's services relating to China investment in the Americas from Canada all the way down to uh, Brazil. So I, I do travel quite a bit and uh, and because of that, I think I have a good feel of what Chinese investments are, uh, uh, are like in the Americas, the difficulties and challenges that they face, the strength and uh, resources that they can also bring to, uh, to the table. And, and tonight I'm trying to summarize all this. So two topics, rise of copper China, uh, the 12 five year plan, I think they're really interrelated. You hear a lot of people talk about uh, Chinese corporation making investment overseas, but you will find out that most of them couldn't even name who are these corporations. And for those that can name the corporations, they really couldn't tell you the forces motivating them to do all these acquisitions, which we're trying to get to uh, the crux of some of this. Um, so now this is a chart that I have presented in the boardroom of Ernst & Young and and I'm sorry that some of my US colleagues were offended by this, but this is basically what we are looking at. A uh, lot of numbers, but let's just go from the far right hand corner to 2005. In terms of global Fortune 500 company in 2005, United States, we have 176 global Fortune 500 company, Japan 81, China 16. And that year, France was still the third place. And then you look to the left, 2011. United States 133, Japan 68, China 61. And when I assumed the role for the area in 2012, I was looking at the 201, uh, 210 number, United States 139, Japan 71 and China 46 and I was pretty impressed by that, by that and at that point I said that well maybe Japan, uh, China would catch up with Japan in 10 years and when the 2011 number were released I was quite surprised and so, so take, take a moment digest the number. So in terms of percentage wise China increased its global Fortune 500 company by almost 300%. Japan, I think, lost about 16. United States, about 24%. Pretty big shift. So when I look at this, I coined the term rise of copper China. You look at this because now let's just look at the table at the bottom. The brick country. We always talk about the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, you know, the four emerging markets. But when you really look at their corporate community, their representation on the global Fortune 500, you see this picture. 2005, China, you have 16 Chinese company, five India, three Brazil, three Russia. 2011, 61 Chinese company, eight India, seven Brazil, seven Russia. You could do the math of the uh, percentage of increase. Total 83 uh, and 61 of the 83 companies are Chinese. 
And also to put in some perspective, if we use South Korea, I think South Korea, very good, strong economy, 14, uh, global fortune 500 and 2011. So when you look at this, you'll find out that the BRIC, they are not really the same class. It's BRI and then the big C. And so when we look at this, Ernst & Young has been around for 100 years, US-based firm, now global, you know, 100, 150,000 people in 140 countries, but pretty much a Western-based service firm. And we look at this, and I ask my leadership, what does it mean, and how do we respond to it? For 100 years, we have been serving corporate, uh, uh, corporate America, corporate Europe very well. Now you look at this. Now, how should we respond to it? Um, in five years, will we see Chinese company represent one-fifth of the global 500? Uh, and what happens if we don't have a fair share of that, of that new class? Uh, can we still be a successful firm? You know, they are debates. They are debates because Chinese companies are still not, um, they still don't operate the way Western companies operate. So from a selfish standpoint, if I were to look at um, the amount of professional fees they spend, uh, I think that, that, that even if the Chinese company were to represent one-fifth of the 500, global 500, they would not represent one-fifth of the total budget for professional fees. So, so this is where we take the macroeconomics and relate back to our business. But still, it will be a very significant force. And it will be a force that most of our Western clients will need to deal with and have to uh, must have a response. I went down to Brazil last year, and I met with one of the biggest engineering company in Brazil. And they want to meet with us, and I was there together with the chairman of our China firm, who happened to be in Brazil at the same time. Um, and at the beginning of the meeting, the board members of this company said, we are not interested in going to China. So. I said, well, then why, why is that that we have this meeting if you're not interested in going to China? And they explained that, that, that even though we are not interested in going to China, we still need to know the Chinese company and, and know how they think, how they operate, because they become our competitors outside of China. Now, this is an engineering company we're talking about. And as I will touch on later on, you will find out that, that the, uh, the industries that corporate China uh, good at. Uh, in infrastructure, construction, you really see a lot of Chinese footprint around the world. So here you have the biggest construction company in Brazil, not interested in going to China, need to have a China strategy. Question? There will not be a test after this, right? So now let's take a closer look. Uh, we, we look at the total, among, uh, total number of companies, but let's just look at the breakup because I think that's important. We need to understand and an appreciation of the quality as well as the quantity. Uh, first, if you look at the 500 companies divided by number one to number 100, you know, so on and so forth, <laughs> I divide it into five classes. So you look at five years ago, uh, in the top 100, we have 33 U.S. companies. And we have a pretty much even distribution uh, in the 200s, the 300s, and the 400s. Pretty good. Then you move fast forward to 2011. In the first 100, you still have 29 U.S. companies. And then, then you see the attrition. Uh, in the 200s, or in the 100s, U.S. went from 42 to 30. In between 200 to 300, went from 37 to 30. In the 300 to 400, 29 to 23, and then 35 down to 21. So now you can see the pattern where the attrition took place. So.
So when I look at that, I ask myself, what does it mean, right? Uh, you know, we're all in the business of looking at data and you have to come up with an answer. And, and I said that, well, this tells us a few things. The biggest, the strongest US company are well entrenched. Their market positions cannot be shaken, notwithstanding the rise of copper China. So the first 100 hold up pretty good. 33 down to 29, mm, still hold on. And, but we really have attrition at the middle or lower uh, levels of the global Fortune 500. Um, and if you were to look into this, you'll find out that a lot of these companies are probably in the old industry type. Uh, and I'll get back to this point. Now, did this also prove one point? I, I talked to a number of US colleagues. I remember when I presented this in, in one of our, our meetings, there was dead silence after I presented the number. Um, and someone said, oh, um, the total number of US Fortune 500 company basically reduced because of consolidation and mergers and all that. I think to some extent that is true, but then if your economy is growing, you should have replenishment. You know, the existing big companies merge, so your number reduce. But then you should also should have new company coming up to fill the ranks. When you look at this, you basically just see an absolute reduction of the population, there's no replenishment. Where we see replenishment, you look at the Chinese number. You look at that. 2005, you have three in the top 100, five, six, and two. And then now you look at 2011, they now have six in the top 100, 13 in the 200, 12, 300, 17 in the 400, 13. So you can see they are really in making their way in. They still haven't got into the first 100, you know, th these are the, the basically the, the first 100 uh, 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 ranks belongs to the very well-run, very sophisticated multinational companies, and the Chinese by and large are not there yet. But they are coming in forcefully, you look at that. So, so then we go back to the point. If we were to take this out to 2020, what would that be like? Right. So now let's take a closer look at wh exactly who are these companies. And this is one of, one of my main point. I've been to a lot of meetings where people talk about Chinese investment. Um, it, it, these are meetings with other business leaders. These are meetings with government officials trying to attract Chinese investment. But I realized that, that they have no clue who these companies are. Now, how can you set any policy when you cannot name them by names, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, you know, you, you got to have a target. If you are a company and, and, and you're trying to market to your customers, you be able to identify your market uh, segments and you should be able to, to label them. And if you don't know them by names, if you're government officials, how are you gonna attract investment? I mean, we have to stop looking at this as a generic, you know, ambiguous uh, group. We have to be able to look into this by, by accounts, uh, in, in our terminology, basically by companies, and know what they do with their name. So let's just take a look at that. Um, out of the top 10 companies in the world, we have three Chinese companies. Sinopec, rank number five. China National Petroleum, basically Petrol China, number six, and State Grid, number seven. So, so now in the top 10, we have three. So remember they have about six in the top 100, so the three is right here. So then that means that they, they really have edged into the top layer but 
they have the quality, but they don't really have the quantity in that top, in that top tier. And then you go down, you know, go down the list. You start to see some banks like ICBC, Industrial Commercial Bank. Um, they have telecom company in China Mobile, China Mobile Communications. Um, I think they have 60% of the market share of, uh, of the telecom market share in China, 400 million users. And so um, I remember one time they told me they went to meet with AT&T and AT&T said that we have 80 million users. And the China Mobile delegation proudly stated that, that they pick up about 80 million users every year. Um, they picking up about 6 million users every month. That's the rate of how fast they are expanding their, their uh, telecom network. Uh, by the way, market cap, I think it's about 300 billion, China Mobile. China Railway Corp, China Railway Construction. I found these two very interesting. They build railway, but they build a lot more than that. Uh, they started off being railway construction company, but right now they are really more like a, uh, 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 a general contractor for all kinds of infrastructure projects, civilian engineering project. Um, and uh, China Railway Construction Corp, uh, CLCC number seven, 105 on Global 500 is my client. Um, I, uh, we serve them in China. Uh, I tracked them down the first day they arrived here to go after the high-speed rail project. That was very interesting. Um, I, uh, I, uh, 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 I, I humor them. I, I said that I said that if you guys can really, if the U.S. really decided to build the high-speed rail, we could really get it going and to build, for example, the San Francisco LA line, and you guys were successful in getting that, you should go back and ask your TV station to make a historical drama about this. Because in the 19th century, the Chinese come and build a railway, and in the 21st century, you come back again and build a railway, and you could make a, a long historical drama talking about how the great-grandfather come and work as a hard labor, and the great-great-great-grandson return and work as an engineer for CLCC. And I said that, and everyone in the meeting today will become a prototype for a character in the TV show. So, so that, but I don't think I get to copyright that. Uh, China Construction Bank, uh, so you have some bank, you have some insurance company. Um, then you start to see uh, automobile, uh, number 13, 13 <coughs> Dongfeng Motors. Now more infrastructure company, China State Construction Engineering. Then you start to see the power grid company. Oh, by the way, state grid, they guess what they do? State grid corporation of China. If anyone give me a, they run the power grid of China, right? Yeah. So, uh, so what are they good at? Let me step back to what are they good at? The power grid that we have in the U.S. are the small grid, the alternating current. I mean, this is the big debate between Westinghouse and Edison going all the way back. So, so I, I, I forgot who started the technology, either the Germans or the Russians started it, but the Chinese actually put it in practice. They built the longest HVDC link in the world uh, right now in China. They connected a water dam on the west side of China and cut across multiple provinces and so basically uh, power Shanghai, you know, 1,300 miles away. And the advantage of having those type of technology is that, that um, if you do direct current, you can minimize your uh, 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 attrition because as the power goes through the line, you lost power. And so what would be the advantage of that? You can then build your power plant far away from population center. Now, I don't think that's why China started it. China started it because if you look at where they get the power, the coal mines and all that, those are more inland, but it's in a coastal area that you have all these uh, 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 population centers. So they have, to, they have to compensate for their irrational distribution of resources. But when you use that technology in other countries, then you get back to the benefit that I mentioned. You could build a power plant far away from population center. 
I mean, they, they can only build so many coal-fired plants along the coast without further polluting the air. So this is one technology right now that China has. And just like China Rail, and they have certain world cutting edge technology in high speed rail. Then you continue the list. Uh, you 16, Shanghai Automotive Car Company, Sinochem, uh, you know, I guess you guys can all figure what they do, all kinds of petroleum chemical products. Uh, China FAW is the first auto works, so again, car company. Uh, China Communications Construction, once again, infrastructure company. They actually building a section of the new Bay Bridge, modulized, you know, they built the bridge in China and then they put it here and then put it together. Uh, Bao Steel, Certec, more telecom company. Um, Min Meadows is a uh, mining company. And Huanang 27 is an engineering company. More steel company. And then uh, you move on to mix, right? So Aviation Corp of China, 32. This is, this, I like this company, very interesting. Um, it used to be the uh, aviation conglomerate of China. Um, I think AVIC-2 used to build all the small jet fighters. AVIC-1 AVIC built the jet fighter, AVIC-2 built the bombers. But they all got put all this into civilian use. So now they go into automobile uh, parts, uh, alternative energy, hospitality business, all kinds. And when I met with them, they said that, that they finally realized that the spirit of any enterprise is deployment of capital. It's not really about making a certain thing. And so for them, they have to find effective use of capital. And so I looked at him and I said, you must have attended some Harvard Business School class. Uh, so if you go down the list more, right? Uh, oh, we, we have some legacy of those British, uh, Hong Kong based uh, British company like Jardin. Uh, so Gang is Capital Steel, so a steel company, aluminum. So now you can get a sense of that what that 61 Chinese global Fortune 500 companies are like. So if you were to summarize it, how would you describe them? Are they, are they Silicon Valley new economy type that they have Facebook and Twitter, you know, right? So what are they like? Yes. Uh, old economy. Old economy. Steel, manufacturing, machineries, and all that. So does that remind us of something that we used to have? Right? Not perhaps not in California, but in the Midwest. Right? So if you look at this, to some extent, they are just going through the process that we have gone through maybe 30, 40 years ago. They do have computer company, 55 Lenovo. But it got the international platform because they acquired IBM's PC business. And uh, I, we serve them in, in North Carolina. Uh, it's no different from any American company. You know, uh, we don't even need Chinese speaking uh, uh, ENY professional on the account team. You know, so, um, so shipbuilding. So I, you see on the, on the far uh, 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 right hand side, I, I have a column. Central SOE. That stands for Central Government Owned, State Owned Enterprises. Um, because in China, the state owned companies are either owned by the central government or owned by the provincial government or the local government. Now, why I list this out? Because this is another characteristic of corporate China. Of the 61, 38 of them are sent basically central government-owned state-owned enterprise. The remaining 20-some 
except for those that have this British heritage like Jardine and all that. All state owned, com mostly state owned companies uh, owned by the local government. So what does that tell us between corporate China and corporate America? State capital. It's state capital. This is a new form. Now whether we like it or not, they are just different. Okay, this is not about uh, 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 privately owned companies that for, I think for the next 20 years, maybe even longer, the core of corporate China, this new force that may represent one, one fifth of the global Fortune 500, um, are gonna be different from the corporate West that we know. They are not gonna be owned by the Bill Gates, you know, founded by the Bill Gates of the world. They're gonna be owned by state. And this is very important because when you own by the state, you're supposed to do certain things, carry out certain business plans that align with the state. And so for policymakers that I mentioned earlier, those that try to attract investment, they need to take note of this. Uh, for business advisors like us, we need to understand, we need to understand that. So now let's take a look at the next slide. So I didn't even get to into the local SOEs, I just stay at the central SOEs. 117 of them. So you could take a look at what types of company we have from your nuclear company to your aerospace to shipping to your defense industry, so, and some airline, 40 and 41. So, once again, all industry, right? Um, oh, by the way, I, I want to touch on an interesting point here, nuclear company. I met with, a, uh, I met with the uh, uh, China Guangdong Nuclear Group one of the two major nuclear groups in, in China. And they said that, that they also have a plan to go overseas. And I was always, I was always candid you know, in, in all the meetings. So I asked him, you learn all your stuff from the French. So do, what do you have to export? I mean, do you have any unique technology? And he made a very interesting point that I had not considered until that point. He said that when you come to infrastructure, civil engineering, building things, it is not the theoretical knowledge that your country possessed in a university classroom. It's the actual practical experience that your workforce as a country possessed. So you may have the cutting edge nuclear theories in your campuses, but if I ask you, can your country today put together a team of engineers that can say in their lifetime, they have built X number of nuclear plants? Many countries will say no, because many countries haven't built anything in the last 20 years. And China, interestingly, because of this high-speed growth in the last 30 years, they have been continuously building roads, railway, power plants, uh, shipyards, steel plan, you name it, for the last 30 years. So when you look at engineering experience, they have it. It's like sports. They have been practicing it continuously. So they said that would be our cutting edge. Just like you go to find a job, they ask you for your resume. You say, I right, we have done this 278 times versus, well, right, we know the theory, but we actually haven't built one in the last 10 years. So an interesting side note on that. More and more and more. So this is what I, I, in the past year I visited a number of states and a number of cities in the US and interestingly many of them now have adopted all kinds of uh, inbound programs. So every city and state try to attract more investment to create more jobs and 
they all say they want Chinese investment. But when I ask them, so what companies have you been targeting? Many of them look at me. And I said, you mean you're trying to get the investment, but you don't know who they are? You can name them? And now, I had a discussion with the US Department of Commerce back in November. And I sensed that, that, that they find that it, it probably is easier to attract uh, privately owned enterprises to come to the US because they think that it's less political and all that. But there lies the challenge. Who do you think got the capital that can do the big project and create a lot of jobs? So how do we continue our country's inbound uh, initiative if we cannot answer that question ourselves? Now, President Obama announced that, that in September, United States will be hosting its first ever inbound summit. We, the country used to be like Los Angeles. If you want to make movies, you come to Hollywood. I don't need to give you any incentives. So end up a lot of people go to Canada. So now we have this program, we're trying to invest, but I, 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 and I, I told many people, I said, if you really want to create jobs and get the investment done, you have to do a lot more than just PR shows that are only good for camera and nighttime TV news. You, know, you have to be specific, you know who they are, you go after them, you find a plan to work with them. Uh, a think tank organization wrote a paper uh, last year uh, basically, the author uh, projected that there would be about one trillion up to two trillion dollars of Chinese outbound capital in the next decade. Traditionally, United States attract about fifteen percent of the world's foreign direct investment, but we're not sure if we could get fifteen percent of the Chinese investment. In fact, the U.S. share of the foreign global direct investment has declined in the past 10 years. So I'm encouraged by the fact that, that the city and states, they all trying to put programs to attract more investment, but how do we make it work? How do we make, actually attract investment, creating jobs, and not just you know, PR shows? That would be the challenge. So then we talk about corporate China, talk about the fact that it's really you know, state-sponsored ca state capitalism and now I talk about where they're gonna act differently. This, is, this gives us a hint, the 12 five year plan. Um, anyone go back to the same question I ask? So on a scale of five to one, five you know a lot, one you don't know anything. Anyone know anything about the five year plan at a, on a scale of five? No, five, no, four, three, Two, one, oh, good, love you guys. So there are a number of reasons you have to know the five-year plan because if you don't know the five-year plan, you really don't know how corporate China thinks and you don't know the direction of the uh, national economic strategy. And so if you're running a business, there might be opportunities that you would not be able to exploit unless you, you understand this. And then you would also not understand some of the forces and challenges faced by China. So I read the 12 five year plan in the original Chinese text, actually very well written, very well written. And I was pretty intrigued by the opening chapter. They produce a balanced scorecard they recited the goal set forth in the 11 five-year plan, and then they show you the actual. Now, you could argue whether those numbers have been audited and all that, but when I look at that, I said, that's government accountability in one way, right? Maybe no election system like we have, but they are committed to make delivery on economic results. And they listed out all kinds of indicators, you know, whether it's the GDP as a country, 
the growth rate, the per capita, number of other scores. They list out actual and plan and actual. And, and it's interesting, I find out that they basically met all their plans under the 11th five year plan. And I relate it back to our beloved country. When was the last time you see a, any officials produce a balanced scorecard of what he promised to do during the election and what he has accomplished? Maybe I missed that news. So basically they said that, well, we, we, have, ac we have accomplished all the major objectives of the 11 five year plan. And interestingly, they said that uh, they viewed, this is the, the way they see the world. They view right now a historical window for achieving strategic development. And they have both opportunities and crisis. Um, I was pretty impressed. I felt like I was reading a strategy memo written by a corporation. It's just like all the stuff that you learn, you know, in, in, in business strategic management. This is how they write this. I guess that's why people said China Inc. So you look at some of the things that, th that they said. They said, well, positive factor, this is important. Their outlook of the world. They said overall, they believe that the world major theme will still be peaceful development and cooperation. I think this is important. They're not saying that, that, that war is imminent and all that. Uh, now, th this will have major impact on, on what they do. I met with one of China's leading Lat Latin America expert two years ago, and he said that this is their worldview, and because of that, they are investing heavily in Latin America's uh, natural resources. And I said, please explain. And he said that for the next 20 years, they will not have a navy that can defend the sea lane from uh, Latin America to China. So obviously, they're relying on a peacetime you know, uh, security for the sea lane. If they really believe that war is imminent, they would have put all the resources in the investment in Central Asia, you know, in Kazakhstan and that area, so it would all be land lane. So I said, very interesting. I never thought of it that way. Um, the other one is, uh, the pluralization and globalization, transformation by technology. But then on the other hand, the world is also, the growth is slowing down, more and more competition, and I get to that later, and they acknowledge the climate change. Now, for internal factors, so now this is why you see, I said that it's really just like a you know, a corporation strategic memo. They give you the overview, they give you the analysis, you know, the overlying analysis, then they discuss the internal factors, and then later on the external factors. So internal factors, they have some, something that work for them, something that work against them. They have built a pretty good foundation. You know, for the last 30 years, they achieved a certain degree of success in industri industrialization, um, they have more tools or resources uh, uh, at the disposal, but at the same time, they're also creating a huge gap between the, um, uh, the urban population and the rural population. How do they balance that is gonna be an issue. So now, let's look at a few things. So they no longer said that growth at all costs. If you read the previous uh, plan, they all say they want like 10%. Now they say 7% is good. Equality 7% because the fact that you get 10% and you cause a lot of pollution, that is not good. Plus, you could end up doing a lot of things that, that boost short-term GDP, but will create a lot of damage in the long run. So because of that, they're now focusing on rationalizing the structure of the e of the economy. And I, I think this is a very interesting point and you probably can do this or really play with this if you have a regime like that. Um, I think that China overall has a more rational uh, economic structure compared to other countries. Uh, you, can, you can say, well, they don't have a high-tech industry, 
but I would say when you have 1.3 billion people, would you rather have a high-tech industry that can only support 50 million people, or do you want to have a medium to low-tech manufacturing base that can support 400 million people? So they're very conscientious about that, and increasing education level, they want to be green, they want to be sustainable, they invest a lot in this area, uh, and, and to improve the overall quality. Now, in order to do this, they have a few specific plan. Overall is to transform the manufacturing base, and there are two lines to it. One is to upgrade the existing traditional manufacturing base, and you could look at what they're gonna focus on. These all come out from the 12 five-year plan, so those of you who want to study it can go and I think English version should be available somewhere on the internet. Um, so for the traditional industrial base, the auto parts, shipping, automotive, steel. Uh, so basically, to give you an example, they can build a bulldozer, they can build an excavator, but they cannot build a bulldozer the same quality that Caterpillar can build. So what that means is they probably will be looking at acquisitions overseas to buy companies that make certain critical component parts. So if you, they can make excavator, but if they buy a company that make better hydraulic crane system, the excavator's quality can increase. This is about the whole uh, uh, upgrading the quality. I talked to some friends working in the steel industry and they will tell you how they have the state-of-the-art equipment better than U.S. steel, but they will admit to you that, that a skilled U.S. steel worker using older machine can actually build better things than their guys in China, which I find very interesting. So it sometimes is not so much what machine, what equipment is, how well you can use the machine and equipment, and then to some extent it's also the not the hardware, but the software, the mindset, right? For example, there was a high-speed rail uh, fiasco in July last year um, uh, in, in China. And when I talk to a lot of Chinese friends, what they will worry about is the West would then say, see, you copy everybody's technology and you cannot integrate it, your technology doesn't work. That's what a lot of Chinese, of my Chinese friends worry about. When I came back to the state and I read The Economist and all the other write-up, I don't recall reading anything at all questioning the Chinese technology, but they question how they manage crisis and how they rescue human life. Totally different. They say, well, they didn't even clear all the trains and before they remove it from the tracks and how do you know there are no survivors? So that I think is the software versus hardware which I think is difficult. You could buy hardware. If you have money, you can buy hardware. Software take years, take years to, uh, to develop. And I can also give you another example on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I spent most of my career actually serving corporate America. Um, on a typical transaction, right? One of my uh, longtime US client uh, we we'll have a team of advisor, and we got into the conference call. Uh, we all know each other on a first name basis, and we can all say that, that oh, remember last time we worked together for this U.S. company or U.S. client, this is how we solve this particular problem, it's very collegial environment. So some Chinese deals that I work on, totally different. Um, they want to bid for the lowest service provider that they can ever find. And ended up on every single deal, you have a different team of advisor working for you. And these guys never work together. So on this international deal, you open up the conference line and usually it's not very effective because of language barrier, of cultural barrier. So at that time I, I told myself, if I would just write down the professional advisors on our side, Chinese side, and the counterparty, they all look impressive. Big firms, you know, Ernst & Young and all the big law firms and all that. But is the quality there? I don't think it's there. Well, that takes a lot of time. 
U.S. company, Western company, I think has really mastered the know-how of globalization, inclusiveness in, in terms of the workforce. U.S. company, very good. Go to any country, you could hire the locals and they got adopted into your, your corporate culture. Um, I think that is a must. If the Chinese company, now that they're big, if they want to go overseas, that's something they need to learn. And then, they, then you have all the uh, strategic emerging industry. Now, this is, what, this is what I call the more Silicon Valley type. Um, exactly how they're going to get there, can they, can, can they get there fast enough, um, I think it's a challenge. I think they actually set a quantitative goal that, that uh, they want the, uh, all the new industry to represent 7% of the GDP as opposed to the current 3%. Uh, now this is once again, uh, back to my reference that, that they're running the country like a corporation. I mean, these are the statement you would expect. A corporation would say, and in the next five years, we expected that Division A will generate 25% of our revenue. I mean, you see the uh, uh, common link. Now, what, what that means is it is a very efficient mobilization system. They can get the resources together and have all the players move towards a common goal within a very short period of time. So, Almost to the end of the five-year plan, you see that, that they set out a few goals. Uh, securing energy and natural resources, you know, we need to say no more. We, we read about this a lot. Um, to some extent, it is justifiable. You know, you, 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 you cannot grow the country unless you have nat enough natural resources. Um, I, uh, uh, steel, for example, I recall a, a friend in the steel industry told me that the that, that United States has I think he said nine billion tons of steel in use I mean, everywhere, right? And when you get to that level, then you can actually stop importing iron ore. You could just recycle your scrap metal. China right now has probably one third of that amount of steel in place. So then that means that for the next many, many years, they still need a lot of iron ore. And to make steel, you also need coal. Um, so this will continue. Uh, they want to continue to invest in overseas. Um, I understand that one of the major uh, automobile companies has set up R&D shop in Detroit. I asked them, why do you come to Detroit? And they said that Detroit still got the, some of the best automotive uh, engineers in the world, but they will never go to China. So if we want to hire them, we have to open up our R&D center in Detroit. I find that quite interesting. Um, encouraging industrial champions to invest overseas. So this is the part where we talk about uh, the Chinese company now that they are big go global company, but they really have to be global, not just big. But I think that, that in order to be global, you have to be big first. I mean, you have to have the muscle you know, in order to make an impact. Uh, creating the international network, creating brands. Now this is where China does not have. There is no equivalent of the Toyota, the Honda, uh, the Samsung yet. But my guess is they probably will be making a name for themselves in the non-consumer products. Maybe in the next five years, we'll start to see more and more uh, turbine engines or, 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 or ships or some sort of industrial goods that will be made from China and also as I said earlier, infrastructure, civil engineering services, uh, which is actually the last point. So with that, I've given you an overview on uh, Rise of Copper China and state-owned, uh, state-sponsored capitalism uh, and the motivating force behind it. Uh, it is a very interesting time for all of us. With a, you look at it from a business standpoint or from a economic recovery standpoint. Uh, we, we all should know more about it, have our perspective on it, so we could form our own uh, viewpoint and judgment and not just listen to what the media have to say.